Foremost means more. More training, more information, more ways to grow your business. Find out what foremost can mean for you at foremostagent.com. Click on Foremost Means More. Maurice Hank Greenberg helped build American International Group, AIG, by opening global markets and getting services industries recognized for their contributions to the economy. He discusses how AIG's efforts dovetailed with U.S. foreign relations and recalls some of the challenges in foreign lands. In this excerpt from an interview with Wells Media Group's Andy Simpson. There's a term uh, that's been uh, used to describe you as a pioneering internationalist. Do you like that term? Well, I, I don't know what the hell that means. <laughs> well, I think it kind of gets to your uh, obvious uh, uh, ability to open up markets in, in foreign countries from China to Poland and all around the world. You convince others to adopt principles of private property, freedom of contract, the rule of law. And I wonder in all of those travels and all that work and success, did you see or do you see yourself as an ambassador for the United States in addition to being a corporate CEO? Well, I don't think of myself as an ambassador to the United States. We turned out to be that in many instances. You know, when we started to expand internationally, uh, the, um, the world did not trade services. A service, the only thing that the U.S. and the WTO uh, rules were was on goods in, service, in, in trade, not services. They didn't even measure it, right? No, 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 no. It was not on. Now, I was on the President's Advisory Board for trade negotiations. And uh, I tried to convince our own government. And it took me through two different presidents to get somebody in our government interested in that. And then it took off. I had great support from Carla Hills, from a, um, a number of the STRs. Um, and we gradually led the, the change in the world on that. We organized something called the Coalition of Service Industries. Jim Robinson was helpful in that. And uh, because banks, credit card companies, insurance companies, uh, were frozen out of markets. We had to pry them open. And it took time. It didn't happen overnight. What do you think are some of the best examples of where opening markets aided the U.S. foreign relations? Foreign relations? Oh, any number of, 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 of countries. Uh, a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly uh, warmed up relations uh, in South Korea and in uh, Japan, uh, go on and on. Eastern Europe. Philippines? Well, you know, the U.S. had a special relationship in the Philippines. Uh, they were a territory of the U.S. We gave them their independence. Uh, but we had a close relationship in the Philippines. Were, were there any times and places where you felt it was not in the best interest uh, of the country for AIG to open a market where you stepped away? Uh, no, you know, by and large, we opened, were they all successful? No, we had a tough time in, in Uganda, as an example, and a couple of other African countries. Uh, Nigeria, at that time, was very difficult. Um, they wanted to essentially steal our company, and they wanted to they tried to force us to sell it for, for, a, for par value, which was a dollar a share, a nominal value. Uh, it took getting a president of the United States uh, to uh, intervene. Uh, you know, so there are some countries, but you're too soon. Uh, we opened markets in Eastern Europe before the Iron Curtain came down. We operated in, even then, the Soviet Union before it became Russia and dropped the Soviet Union. You mentioned Uganda, and I know that was a place where you walked away. You said, that's not some place I'm going to do business. Are there other world leaders today with whom you would never do business? If there are, I'm not going to mention them. Because <laughs> they change? Well, you know, we're not going to do business in Iran. We were nationalized there. We got compensated in the world court. Uh, we were nationalized in, in Pakistan. Uh, we got compensated, but we went back into Pakistan when uh, Bhutto's daughter became the prime minister. And, um, and we got our license back. Um, you know, so 
you have to, you know, things change from time to time, and you know what may not be uh, desirable in one era, desirable in another era. There is that pattern, isn't there? Sometimes of entering a market and then going through a period of unrest or even nationalization, and then getting back in under different terms. Yeah, well, that happened in China. You know, Star uh, opened in China in 1919, went back after World War II, and you had a communist revolution. He was forced to shut down. Uh, I went back in 1975. You mentioned um, the services sector and its contribution to the economy and uh, how uh, you're you're instrumental in getting that measured for for the first time, first of all, and then included in global trade agreements. I wonder, what is your view of attaching human rights, environmental, or other conditions to global trade agreements? You know, I think you have to be uh, careful about that. If we start to... to, uh, and that's one reason we have such few trade agreements. It took us seven years to negotiate an agreement with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama. Uh, I chaired the U.S. Korea Business Council at the time. Uh, it took us, I don't know how many years, and we didn't conclude it in, uh, during I, when I was chairman. It was concluded maybe a couple of years after I, my tour as chairman was up. Uh, the unions in our country make it very difficult to get approval from Congress to negotiate trade agreements. So what's happened? So China negotiates a free trade agreement with the ASEAN countries maybe about 10 years ago. We did not. We used to be the largest trading partner in the ASEAN region. We're now number four uh, after China negotiated a free trade agreement their business soar and their relationship soar. And so it's not in our national interest uh, to not negotiate more trade agreements. Uh, You can't tell a country uh, what to do in their country. If if they want to not uh, to follow uh, union practices, that's up to them. It's their country. Uh, We can't we can't negotiate an agreement and tell them what to do in their in their backyard. It's their country, not ours. Does the effect, does opening markets, though, have an effect on those policies that we well, might Well, of course like? it does. I mean, if you're there and you, and, and you treat your employees differently uh, and you meet with leaders in that country and explain why it's in their national interest over a period of time uh, to adapt certain practices, you don't win all the time, but you win many times. And it's that kind of a dialogue that's important. That's why American business operating globally has an influence on the behavior in many countries. In, in terms of assessing global marketplaces today, where do you think there's more opportunity, Latin America or Asia? Well, that's a broad statement. Asia takes in you know, a, a, a lot of territory from... Uh, from South Korea down to Indonesia, um, so you got to you know you have to be a little more uh, 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 definition, a little bit more uh, thoughtful. Uh, Latin America is you've got some mixed uh, reviews, better than it was. Um, Colombia is a better place than it was four years ago. Brazil has done quite well. It's up and down, but it's done quite well. Argentina uh, has got some political issues, uh, but you know, uh, I say Peru and Chile are pretty. They're small, but they're not bad. Uh, Mexico has gotten much better. Um, you know, so you know, it, it depends on what business you're in, mm-hmm. and um, and and how you approach the country. The um, one of the principles you talk about in the book in terms of expanding internationally is investing locally in the people and in the economy. And I'm wondering, if if I'm a CEO of another country thinking about going into a foreign country, what would you advise me to learn, to know about, to watch for? You know, you're making this into a, uh, uh, that I'm outlining a a script to how I can improve my my competitors' uh, uh, operations. you know, 
I'd say that uh, I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> but you did invest locally, and that was a yeah, cornerstone look, of your look, success. Generally, you have to understand the culture of a country uh, before you start doing business in it. You can't just go in and out. What American companies have done historically in our industry, they go into a country uh, many times because we were there. Uh, they don't do well, and they pack up and go home after they have raised everybody's salary about 50% more than it should be. And so they cause disruption in the marketplace and go home. That's not a good idea. What do you think about companies that, for instance, run their Latin American operations from Miami or something? Well, you know, I think everybody does what he thinks is okay, as long as you have people that travel to Latin America. You know, it's, sometimes it's less expensive to move a whole family and have cost of living um, adjustments uh, rather than live in Miami. 